I think we'll make a start. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to this seminar. Um, apologies uh, that Bridget O'Glocklin couldn't uh, make it. Um, she, uh, there was just unforeseen circumstances. She couldn't make it over from the Netherlands. But um, Gilbert Achkar and Hassan Cherry have graciously stepped in at the, at the very last minute and have prepared an excellent uh, seminar that I think will be very um, interesting. Um, the overall title is Neoliberal Dogmatism, the IMF and the Arab Spring. Um, Gilbert uh, will be talking about uh, specifically the catastrophic consequences of neoliberal dogmatism in the MENA region. Uh, in the Middle East and North Africa region. And uh, just to say, I'm sure all of you know Gilbert, uh, he's professor in uh, the Department of Development Studies uh, at SOAS. On the topic of his talk, he's published uh, The People Want, a Radical Exploration of the Arab Uprising in 2013. And that was followed by um, a sequel called Morbid Symptoms, Relapse in the Arab Uprising in 2016. And those books, um, I believe, are outside um, um, uh, to, to buy, uh, if you would like. Uh, and Hassan Sherry will be talking about the myth of a changing IMF, uh, unpacking IMF conditionality in MENA post-uprisings. And Hassan is a PhD um, candidate in economics in, uh, at, at SOAS, and his research focuses on late industrialization in Lebanon, and he's written on the Arab uprisings, social, social justice, and the role of the IFIs in uh, the Middle East and North Africa. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll start with Gilbert uh, and then we'll move directly on to Hassan and then open it up to questions, directly to questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Faisi. Um, and uh, good evening to, to all. <clears throat> uh, when Faisi asked me a few days ago, actually I can't remember, yeah, maybe less than one week or something like this, a week ago, uh, to, uh, to replace at the last minute the, the, the today's uh, speaker, uh, I immediately thought of, uh, of arranging this, uh, uh, this event with, uh, with Hassan, who's uh, preparing a PhD here in economics and who had recently written an excellent uh, study of uh, the IMF uh, role in the post-uprising uh, phase in, uh, in, uh, in MENA countries. And that would be better than just me giving you uh, a preview of my course of next, uh, next term, because my course next term is precisely on, on those issues. I mean, it's called Problems of Development in the Middle East and North Africa. So what I'll be doing basically is to, it's connected of course to the course and giving you a kind of a little uh, um, a preview of, uh, of some of the views or, or issues that are discussed, that I discuss in the course, of course in relation to our, uh, our uh, topic. So, um, and uh, yeah, I suggested this title, Neoliberal Dogmatism, uh, the IMF and the Arab Spring. Um, and indeed, it is an issue of, uh, of, uh, of, of dogmatism uh, that uh, we are dealing with. You know, uh, dogmatism is usually attributed to, to the left and uh, you know, any kind of ideological, so-called ideological currents. But the truth is that uh, uh, the, the IMF is an extremely dogmatic institution. Uh, in the past, you had a joke about the IMF calling it the international monetarist fundamentalism. Um, that's very much warranted. That's a, a real characterization of what the IMF uh, is, uh, is about. The, 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 the fact is that uh, the neoliberal perspective is based on a number of uh, postulates one of them is what we could call an anthropological postulate, is the famous uh, homo economicus, the economic human, um, who uh, is supposed to be uh, guided by an economic rationality. Uh, and this economic rationality is essentially predicated on the maximization of profit as the main target and goal animating this uh, human being. And hence, from that perspective, you get into the view that uh, if you uh, free this, uh, this uh, economic human uh, 
from any kind of, uh, of uh, uh, limitations, uh, they will be able to, to thrive and, uh, and uh, create a so-called virtuous circle of, uh, of growth and, uh, and development. So basically, this basic, very general postulate, which is at the basis even of classical economics, uh, is, the, is at the core of, uh, of the neoliberal uh, perspective. And it is connected uh, to uh, a, another postulate, which we could call a systemic uh, postulate, um, which is uh, an ideal type of capitalism, that is the, the, the view of capitalism with which this kind of perspective is linked, is an ideal uh, uh, model of capitalism, uh, which as the ideal type would, would have it, is based on uh, uh, predictability, the ability of the rational actor, the rational economic actor to calculate, uh, to, uh, I mean, this whole operation of profit maximization is connected to a framework through which you should be able to make long-term long plans uh, in the investment of, uh, of your, your money. And when these conditions are, uh, are um, uh, offered, then you have this virtuous circle and you have uh, long-term uh, investment, which is the uh, most con conducive to, to development. That's how the, 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 the theory uh, uh, would, would want it, but that's a very general and uh, um, uh, in some way uh, idea, ideal or abstract model uh, and for a big part of, uh, of our planet this is a utopian model in the sense that it does not exist in vast uh, areas uh, of, uh, of, of the world and uh, the, the Middle East and North Africa is definitely uh, a key one of these areas and probably the one which is the farthest uh, from the ideal uh, uh, conception upon which uh, the neoliberal perspective is, uh, is based. Now this is a part of the world which in the 60s in particular has uh, um, gone through uh, various developmentalist experiences of uh, left-wing leaning, most of them uh, calling themselves socialists, most of the kinds, uh, where you had uh, high, relatively high degrees of, uh, of um, uh, st uh, state involvement in, uh, in industrialization, in uh, uh, economic and also social development because they, those were related to social gains uh, such as the democratization of uh, health and education, which uh, uh, had the major steps forward, including tertiary education uh, during uh, that period. Uh, in, from, starting from, from the 70s, with, uh, which sees uh, uh, the, the uh, synchronized recession, the major, one of the important, let's say, crises crisis in the history of, uh, of capitalism globally, um, we see uh, in the region an offensive towards uh, 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 dismantling the, 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 this, uh, the, the, this, the, the model of the 60s and uh, an offensive which, will be, which is inspired from, by this neoliberal thought which will impose itself uh, as the dominant economic paradigm uh, uh, starting from the 80s uh, uh, at the level of uh, international financial institutions, although even before the 80s, as I said, in the 70s, you already had uh, uh, um, a pressure in that, uh, in that direction. So that will lead to the so-called Washington Consensus, and, uh, uh, the, 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 which uh, is the, the, uh, the, the set of principles upon which the international financial institutions those based in Washington, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and also the, the American uh, Trade and, uh, um, and the Federal Reserve, uh, upon which those institutions which are decisive in the global economy were working. And for the region, that has meant uh, rolling back the state. But when we say rolling back the state, we have to keep in mind that neoliberalism uh, is mostly about 
economic liberalism, it is much less about, despite the claim, about political liberalism. So roll back, rolling back the state was rolling back the state in, in, the, in the economic sphere, the, 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 the role of the state in the economy, uh, whereas the, 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 the despotic character of the state, which uh, was already characterizing the region, uh, was not uh, altered, and the IMF did very little, was very little concern uh, uh, about that. And we could say the same, actually, about the kind of, uh, of spending that is rolled back, which usually is social spending, whereas uh, military spending, for instance, which is extremely high in this part of the world, is not uh, affected, and the IMF pays very little attention to this major uh, chunk of, uh, of state uh, uh, expenditure. Now, the idea behind all of that was we roll back the state, we free, uh, you know, like liberation, we free the, the market, we free the, the private sector, and you will see how once freed, they will, uh, you know, uh, do miracles, accomplish miracles, and uh, that will happen through this rationality that we mentioned, uh, uh, upon which the, the model is, is based. Now, the key point is that uh, the, those postulates upon which all this is based, as I said, uh, do not apply, uh, are very far from reality in uh, this part uh, of, uh, of, of the world. And essentially, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but uh, this is probably the most unpredictable, or one of the most unpredictable, maybe there is another region disputing uh, that uh, record to, to MENA every now and then, but on, on, uh, the, on several decades, that's definitely the most unpredictable part of the world, whether we're speaking of general political unpredictability due to regional conditions or local conditions, or unpredictability of the type of government that you have, uh, which are usually autocratic or despotic governments uh, and uh, uh, states where the rule of law is completely absent. There is no real rule of law uh, and therefore not one of the key conditions of this uh, um, systemic postulate upon which the neoliberal perspective is, uh, is based. And what you get with this? Well, you get actually one thing is true, human beings are generally rational beings, and capitalists are uh, rational uh, economic uh, creatures, uh, and they seek to maximize their profit. But if you have money and you are in an unpredictable situation, well, your, the rational choice to do is not to go for long-term heavy investment or all that the type of investment that leads to industrialization, but to go after quick profit, speculative profit, or state-connected uh, rent-based uh, kind of, uh, of uh, uh, businesses, uh, as is uh, very current in the region, uh, in, uh, in the frame of what we, we call crony, uh, crony capitalism. So state connection remains uh, essential. And this type of economic uh, um, model is not conducive to development. And hence, it has produced, since its gradual implementation in the, from the 70s, 80s, with uh, an acceleration in the 90s and uh, uh, until uh, today, it has produced uh, a massive uh, uh, social and economic uh, uh, failure, uh, which is the main root, the main reason behind the big explosion of 2011, uh, which the so-called Arab Spring, which was not only about democracy or freedom, but also, and I would say uh, primarily, about, even in the chronology of the events, about uh, jobs, bread, social justice, and such social and economic demands, along with, of course, freedom and democracy. So, uh, don't have much time uh, to, to, to get into details about all, all that, but that was a general framework, and I can try to show you a few, uh, a few uh, slides, which are graphs, uh, most of them taken from uh, uh, my book, The, the People Want. Um, you can see the, the, how the, uh, the, the growth, per, the per capita growth of the region, the trend of the gro uh, uh, GDP, the gross domestic product per capita, the annual growth of that, uh, 
has been a declining trend in the region uh, uh, from the 70s uh, onward and uh, with a, a result of, of much lower uh, um, average rates at, uh, at the end of the period than what you had in the, uh, in the 60s. And that is connected to uh, a declining trend of uh, investment, or what in economic terms here is called gross capital uh, formation. Uh, if you remove, this is without the, uh, the oil monarchies of the Gulf, and you see the, uh, the, the clearly uh, declining uh, trend. Um, so in general, there is a problem of that. It, remove the per capita and stick it to, to take it in general terms, and you still have the problem for the, 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 the last two decades preceding the uprising. You can see how the Middle East and North Africa uh, is uh, quite, uh, I mean, has quite lower levels of investment, uh, of uh, investment growth than, uh, than even Sub-Saharan Africa, let alone South Asia and East Asia, that is India and China, uh, essentially, with uh, much higher uh, uh, rates of uh, growth of uh, investment. Now, the reason for that is connected to, to what I was discussing in my general introduction, which is where does uh, money go, where is, uh, what kind of investment you have, what levels of investment you have. And if you take the levels of investment compared to GDP, uh, aside from the fact that they are, that this level is declining, as we have seen, uh, we, you can see that it's declining and uh, quite uh, lower than where you get or the upward and uh, much higher results that you get in uh, South Asia, again, India, essentially, and uh, East Asia, uh, China, uh, above all. Um, and if, when we take a closer look at that, we see that during that, uh, that period, we see that there is a stagnation in MENA of uh, public uh, investment. That was a result of all those uh, reforms and changes pushing back, rolling back the, uh, uh, the, the role of the state uh, in the economy. Uh, uh, compare with uh, East Asia and China, and you will see how important the role of the public sector was actually uh, um, in, in the Chinese, uh, the so-called Chinese economic miracle. Um, now, it's true here that uh, South Asia had even less than that, but South Asia was a, con was a country, I mean, India in particular was a country where there were conditions due to the kind of uh, uh, production of services or export-oriented services, the potential for that. There was a potential that uh, uh, could take advantage of the neoliberal reforms uh, to, to thrive, albeit at a social cost which is very high, but, but still. Uh, uh, um, now, and here you see it, you see the private sector and you see that South Asia had, uh, uh, I mean, compensated for the low uh, public sector investment by a, a relatively high degree of uh, private sector uh, investment, uh, whereas we see the same stagnation at, uh, at uh, low rates in, um, in, in, in MENA. Uh, the, this uh, fall down of East Asia is related to the financial crisis that struck the region uh, in the late uh, 90s. Um, now, all today, I mean, all studies about that show the, the, the reason for that. There's, there was recently a, 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 an, an enterprise survey by World, the World Bank and a number of other financial institutions, and it showed, I mean, no surprise, that the main problem, the two main issues were political instability and corruption. Those were the key issues brought forward by the, the business community uh, uh, which was surveyed by, by this. Uh, if we take an example from, from Egypt, you, we see how the, the state has shrunk, uh, uh, which was the main provider of, uh, of formal jobs, actually, and the private sector has stagnated. And the result is a big increase in uh, informal uh, employment, which is most of it uh, is disguised unemployment, actually. Um, and uh, the result is the same, the, the same at the level of Egypt that what we saw in the, the general picture. Uh, and th the comment is by the, the World Bank, private investment remains lo low, capital flight high. So that's the proof of the pudding, pudding. That's exactly what we're saying, that this model 
uh, applied to the region uh, leads to uh, uh, very bad uh, consequences. Uh, the most important of it is uh, record unemployment rates. The region has held the highest rates of unemployment in the world for several decades now. Uh, this unemployment is uh, mostly uh, youth unemployment, very high youth unemployment if you compare North Africa and the Middle East here, which are very far above the rest of, uh, of the world. Uh, and that's not because there are more young people in the region uh, in proportion than in the rest of the world. That's not true. Uh, the, 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 the proportions are more or less comparable, anyhow very far from this big gap in unemployment. Um, uh, also we note a very high unemployment of uh, tertiary educated uh, young people, and that's connected to the withdrawal of the state, which was the main purveyor of jobs for those uh, uh, graduate. Uh, and uh, a terrible problem of female uh, unemployment, uh, and female uh, uh, participation in the labor force, not only, the, uh, which is more general, which is very low in the region, and that's again connected to the withdrawal of the state, which, because the state was, is the main provider of, of jobs for women, uh, whether traditional sectors like health, education, or others, that's, uh, that was, and, and this retreat of the state led to this uh, increase, a very sharp increase in uh, female uh, unemployment. So, in a nutshell, that's the, the, the kind of, uh, of situation that was created by the, the neoliberal uh, uh, changes, uh, the neoliberal inspired changes uh, in the region, and this is the ground upon which you had this big explosion in 2011. Now, where we see dogmatism at its uh, uh, worst is that the reaction of the IMF, of the international financial institutions to this, to the big explosion, as Hassan will show in a, in a second, was uh, actually more of the same. And we'll get back to that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Shilber. And while uh, Hassan is uh, just getting ready, uh, if, you can, if you have a seat beside you, if you could just shift over, uh, and if you want to move to a seat, there are one there and a couple there and one at the top there, uh, one over there, if you, if you want to, or you can sit on the, on the aisle here. Um, and also, I should have said uh, in the beginning, if you, are, if you want to tweet, if you're into that sort of thing, or if you want to follow our tweets, uh, the hashtags are SOAS Dev Studies, all one word, and ESRC. And um, Patrick over there is tweeting away. Yeah, we have checked about the temperature in the past, and for some reason, they just it's, it's regulated uh, elsewhere, and we can't. I'm sorry for that, if you have a jacket or something, and hopefully the number of people in the room will <laughs> make it a bit bearable. Okay, Hassan, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Faisi and Gilbert. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time presenting at SOAS. I'm extremely delighted to be on the same panel with my supervisor, Professor Gilbert Asher, who is my third supervisor. Um, as you know, this, um, I'm going to be presenting some of the main findings from my recently published paper. Um, it's about the IMF involvement in the Arab region uh, post-uprisings. So what I would try to answer is the central question, which is the following. Has the IMF, through its um, recommendations in the region, um, stood by its narrative of advancing social objectives uh, by allowing more policy space to Arab countries to uh, redesign their policies in a way that would be in line with the long-term dynamic development projects and this is the main question that I try to answer. To answer this, the paper focuses on the IMF lending arrangements with four Arab countries, particularly Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, and Lebanon. Um, the choice of countries is dictated so solely by the uh, well, research project that the Arab NGO Network for Development and the Swedish uh, International Development Agency uh, research series of research publications. And, uh, we do have to, I do have to uh, identify that caveat to keep in mind, which is that we do not um, pretend that our study is comprehensive, 
in depth or breadth of analysis, but however, and we do reckon that our choice of four Arab countries cannot really give a proper picture of the whole Arab region, which is very heterogeneous in terms of its political economies, its economic structures, etc. But however, it does give a clear, some sort of indication about the general direction of IMF lending in the region and the sort of consequences or impacts on, certain, on social and economic development. I would assume that most of you are familiar with the region. Uh, Professor Gilbert Asher spoke about it. I wouldn't dwell much on that. Suffice here to contend that since the mid-1980s, which was a turning point in the, um, uh, uh, in, in the kind of political economic orientation of the region, we know that it was a very much state-led um, kind of um, region in terms of its uh, mode of economic development, with the exception of a few countries, such as Lebanon, that, are, that happen to be more constrained and happen to um, focus on other sorts of advantages like forging outward, link, outward linkages with other countries uh, or let's say the West and trying to serve as entrepots uh, between uh, the regional autarchic order and Western capital. Um, the mid, it, there's something very important that one of the mo most effective mechanisms for regional wealth sharing was via labour market linkages. So uh, rich GCC countries for example, rich o Arab oil rich countries would demand labour from the rest of Arab non-oil rich countries and emigrant workers would kind of send back remittances at home which would be channeled into investments or consumption, health education, etc. But after the 1980s crisis, it meant that the Arab region, especially the autarchic order, could not, is not able to maintain its redistributive <laughs> commitments. So some of the, uh, the countries had to undergo some reforms. Some of the countries went to local creditors to get money. Some others that weren't able to get money from local creditors resorted to the IMF and the World Bank for help. And that is where the, IMF, the IMF's engagement in the region was amplified. Um, obviously, needless to say that the um, SAPs have backfired globally, we see more globally, on a, on a, on a global level, we see the more uh, intensity and frequency of banking and financial crisis, Argentinian, Asian, global financial crisis to say the least. Obviously in the region, the uprisings is a case in point. Now what happened is that there was a sort of a change in narrative for the IMF. Prior to 2011, concepts like inclusive growth, like equality of opportunity, like um, inequality, um, sustainable development were non-existent in the formal communications of the IMF and recipient Arab countries. We even heard like Madame Lagarde saying that numbers don't tell the whole, whole story. We need to see what lies behind those numbers. Who are bearing the fruit, who are enjoying the fruits of growth in those countries. So even if Arab countries achieved some sort of growth, it was jobless growth, it was based solely on rentier uh, uh, activities. But this change in narrative post uprisings should not be decoupled from the broader change in narrative following the financial crisis. So in a seminal work in 2010 by the IMF, uh, it's a paper called Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy. It's a staff note actually. It acknowledged the importance of issues like counter cyclical spending, issues like um, uh, allowing least developed countries more space for implementing um, capital controls, particularly ex ante controls to prevent volatility in the capital markets. So this sort of a change in, in narrative is very welcome from an institution that at least does not consider itself bound by human rights obligations. But still, the change in narrative did not deviate much from the mainstream kind of uh, conventional assumptions that are predicated on neoclassical theory, which essentially, said, which essentially stipulates that once macroeconomic stabilization is in place, growth will follow, development will follow. And this is what we'll see wasn't the case in the region. Broadly, as of a few months earlier, into the, April 2017, the IMF's all sorts of financial arrangements with Arab countries, loans, credits, aid packages, amounted to $57.3 billion from 2011 until 2017. 75% of those were in 2016 alone. So what I would think is that uh, what concerns the region the most is whether these loans carry conditionality or not, and what sorts of conditionality do they carry. 
So looking at the breakdown of conditionality by policy area in those loans uh, to Arab countries, we see that there's a broad spectrum of policy areas that the IMF in fact taps into. So financial sector monetary policy, central bank independence reforms, uh, fiscal issues, tax, wage containment, etc., etc., labor issues, privatization, social policies, you know, you know the drill, this is the uh, standard package. So 2011 till 2017, this graph shows a total of 331 conditionalities. But remember that these 331 conditionalities are actually only for 25% of the loans between 2011 and 2017. So if we include the 75 remaining percent, I don't have the figures, but I would assume that these numbers, this figure would, these figures would at least double. Now, what's interesting in this is that upon the establishment of the IMF, upon, in the Articles of Agreement establishing the IMF, the mandate was clear. It was to focus solely on economic issues of macroeconomic stabilization. So some of the tools that the IMF would have at hand at the time would be upon its uh, establishment would be issues related to contractionary monetary policy, uh, devaluing exchange rates, etc. But it was never mandated to go into more sensitive issues, more sensitive policy areas. And this is where we see that those policy areas like labor issues, privatizations, social policy, institutional reforms, etc., these necessarily lie under the structural policy content. And uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz in his um, 2002 Globalization and its Discontent um, suggests that the IMF has actually moved from the economic uh, uh, areas to non-economic areas that fall under the realm of politics and thus they can influence and demean national sovereignty. Now, back to our case studies, the four countries, Egypt, Jordan, Tunisia, and Lebanon. What the study tries to say is that despite the slightly different uh, directions of IMF lending and conditionality in those countries, there are general trends. The trends I, in the paper, I classify them into three categories, monetary and exchange rate policies, fiscal policies and market, free market or the so-called structural policies. General trend in monetary policy is that it's largely contractionary. Raising um, interest rates, you know, uh, stabilizing inflation, and building up external buffers, even at the expense of a shrinking real economy. Um, exchange rate policy varies by political economy. Of course, there are certain political considerations to it. In Lebanon and Jordan, the IMF supports a pegged exchange rate, whereas in uh, Tunisia and Egypt, it supports a more floating kind of, and it actually asks for a devaluation of the exchange rate. And we'll see the repercussions in a, in a moment. Fiscal policy, needless to say, it's heavily focused on austerity, and that's the order of the day, really. Uh, tax reforms, subsidy cuts, wage containment, actually it's in all four countries, uh, instead of what we believe to be a, a Keynesian um, kind of expansionary policy to boost aggregate demand. Not any sort of expansionary policy. We'll come to that in the conclusions. Now, each of those categories and then the repercussions of those uh, policies. In the monetary and exchange rate, just recently, or actually in the formal communications, uh, staff documents to Egypt and Tunisia, the IMF called for a devaluation to let market forces determine the exchange rates. And uh, in order to kind of contain any potential inflationary pressures, the IMF called for a tight contractionary monetary policy to raise interest rates and uh, to shore up reserves. In Jordan and Lebanon, it's a bit different. So it's a pegged exchange rate regime. So what really, sh what, what the IMF suggests is that monetary policy should remain contractionary even if we had to raise interest rates higher. Uh, in order to shore up reserves and try to uh, maintain that policy peg, which is like a supreme objective for Lebanon and to a lesser extent in, Jer in Jordan. Uh, interesting to mention that the debt to GDP in, in Lebanon is, was 150% in uh, 2016, third only to uh, Greece and Japan. Well, in 2006, it was the highest in the world at 185%. In Jordan, it's, it stood at 93%. So what we can, the broad trend from monetary and exchange rate policy is uh, 
is a continuancy of the inflation targeting model. And this is easily discernible in, in the region. Now, the repercussions just this year earlier in Egypt, even after applying a contractionary monetary policy and raising interest rates for consecutive six months, inflation stood at 30% in May 2017. This led to a rise in costs of food, beverages by more than 40%. And we have to keep in mind that Egypt is a country where almost half of the population is, lives near or below the poverty line. And this essentially means that the uh, minimum wage in Egypt, which currently is around 1,200 Egyptian pounds, is deemed as insufficient at least for not even for subsistence levels. And this is one of the uh, major presidential campaigns by Khaled Ali, who's, a, who's running for president in the next presidential elections. And he's kind of asking for an immediate increase in the minimum wage for 2,000 Egyptian pounds until they kind of raise it further later. So these are the kind of political issues that such policies have, have induced in those countries. We, we also note that in e Egypt and Tunisia are both net importers of food and agricultural products. So any, any, any inflationary impact from the devaluation is necessarily passed on to consumers. Now, when it comes to inflation targeting, um, this has been a trend in Lebanon and Jordan since the 90s. Lebanon pegged the exchange rate in 1993 following the, civil, the end of the civil war. And in Jordan, it was in 1995. Uh, the problem with that sort of framework is that it cultivated an environment ex of exclusionary growth. So raising interest rates means that you are making money more costly, and then you'd probably invest in capital markets, because this is easy gain, right? This is what Professor Gilbert was just discussing. And then in Lebanon, one of the, and Jordan, one of the essential policies is that commercial banks would finance the debt and the deficit incurred by the governments. And then this is easy money, right? And so it, it really bloated the profits of the banking sector, at least in, in, in Lebanon. And uh, one of the most important um, uh, implications is the delinking de de of finance from the real economy and underlying some sort of a Dutch disease. Because when you raise the interest rates and you've got all these massive inflows of capital and finance into the country, then you have... A, appreciation of the real exchange rate, economic theory says that this comes to the, de to the detriment of manufacturing other tradables and to the benefit of non-tradables such as construction, real estate, finance, etc. Now fiscal policy, again, cuts in public <coughs> wages and employment, cuts in energy subsidies, tax reforms. The IMF tries to compensate for that in its uh, uh, policies by asking the countries to apply something that's called targeted social, targeted social protection or targeted assistance, uh, which is necessarily social safety nets or cash transfers, such as in Egypt, for example. But this obviously goes, it doesn't go along the lines of uh, a more universal human protection, uh, social protection strategy, which is uh, stipulated in the, in the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals in order to achieve economic and social rights in all developing countries, the world in general. Um, of course, these demands also overlook the institutional inadequacies, lack of accurate population data so that you can able to, be, to identify those uh, poor segments of the population. In many villages in Lebanon and Egypt, they still don't have electricity until today, so it's really difficult for, for the uh, government to target. Repercussions um, in Tunisia, you know, these, these kind of many, many, uh, there is a popular outcry that these kind of policies contradict the objectives of the revolution in the first place, and that's because the, before the government was elected, the UGTT, which is the union, General Union of Trade, um, of Trade Workers in Tunisia, they agreed on a salary increase. And then the IMF came, the policies came and stopped that increase, and that really meant that the trade unions and labor groups would all threaten to withdraw their uh, support. In Egypt, thousands, uh, according to such policies, thousands of uh, public servants would have to be laid off, and uh, wage, wages, public wages have to be frozen. Um, obviously, that means the, uh, the way in which the Egyptian state is regarded as more as an administrative body and stripped out of its social functions. Uh, <clears throat> in Lebanon, the issue of taxation is clear 
and, and very uh, lucid in the formal communications of the IMF with the country. But really, the, and it comes above everything else, above <coughs> private investments, above the uh, public investments in infrastructure, which are necessary in the country. Um, and it really reflects some sort of an IMF ba bias towards using taxation as an extractive measure rather than as a tool for redistribution, be especially in light of the prime objective of stabilization in the country and the fact that the country needs revenues in order to finance the debt and service the debt. Same thing in, in Jordan, you know, removing, uh, well, actually uh, levying taxes on very essential products, etc. So what we can see from the fiscal and monetary and exchange rate policy paradigms in the, country, in, in the four countries is that these measures are strictly political and not technical in their nature. And they really do alter the distribution of uh, wealth and power and economic burdens to the detriment of the working and middle classes. Now, the last of these categories, the standard sine qua non, uh, you know, uh, policy of any IMF package to the region since the late 80s, early 90s until today, further liberalization of trade, further liberalization of investment, the regulations, labor market deregulation, even privatization of state-owned banks and state-owned enterprises. Uh, so this is, this is clearly a three decades old trend. And uh, there were obviously repercussions to that trend. But to see the repercussions, we have to see them on a longer term scale and not on a short term scale because, because these are structural issues. So first of all, in all countries, not only in these four countries, but it's, like, it's an obvious trend in the region in general. Weaker public employment, coupled with an inability of the private sector, of the formal private sector, to attract that massive pool of unemployed labor, particularly youth. And so, uh, increase in informal employment with weak social protection, as Hilbert discussed, it's with disproportionate effects on youth and women. Now, the region, in terms of its economic activities uh, and exports, it was very much intensified in the low-value-added activities, which have limited spillover effects to the rest of the uh, um, sectors, and thus, thus there's weak growth and employment uh, potentials for those um, low added value activities. Not to mention the dominance of natural resources, and if not particularly upstream natural resource activities, the dominance of activities that are connected to these, uh, like energy intensive industries and stuff. And most, most of them are really capital intensive with kind of um, not very high prospects for employment generation. This is, this is a graph that I really like, and I, use, I like to use in many of my presentations. And it's like the structure of the uh, uh, export basket of the Middle East and North Africa to the rest of the world in 2016. So if we, can, if we take a look at the general, um, let's say, the product, product uh, um, uh, subsectors, we can see that it's broadly dominated by, well, 26.81% fuels, which are natural resources, capital intensive with low job generating uh, effects, stone and glass, which is low technology, and miscellaneous. Miscellaneous is like, you can think of it as, because they cannot classify, it's not yet classified under the UN classification system. So miscellaneous can contain all sorts of activities exported, or export uh, products exported to countries. But normally, for the Middle East and North Africa, these products essentially fall under the um, lower tiers of the global value chain or the uh, lower t with low technology and low knowledge content uh, in them. So that sort of explains what, what these kind of policies have led the region through. Um, I wouldn't dwell much on that. Uh, Professor Gilbert talked about it, but I would just add something that this proportional effect of youth unemployment, which is the highest in the world, standing at 30% compared to a world average of 14% is dis disproportionately affects females in the region. And youth unemployment amongst women in the MENA region is 47% compared to a world average of 24%. And these are striking figures really because they can tell a story about not only the, well, some, some would like to explain it along cultural lines, I would necessarily explain it among structural lines. This is, this is why we have these, uh, we, can, we can dwell on that later. So to conclude, uh, before citing the general um, policy alternatives, 
what we can see really is that the post-uprisings, similar to what Gilbert explained previously, is a mere repackaging of the pre-uprisings model. There is an obvious distance between the narrative of the IMF and its actual policy implementation. Probably the only credit that, the, that such policies can be given is like they argue for, for strengthening social safety nets, they argue for uh, raising food subsidies and cash transfers, but this is not enough really. Uh, because this is still predicated upon the same neoliberal or let's say neoclassical assumptions that don't really align with the realities of the region, neither the political nor the economic and social realities. Um, obviously there is an evident bias for, bias for macroeconomic stability over social issues in all formal communications of the IMF. These, there are specific targets for macroeconomic variables, like we have to bring down the deficit, we have to cut taxes, we have to cut wages, etc. But there are no such concrete uh, targets for issues related to inclusive growth, issues related to bringing down or alleviating inequality, issues related to health and education outcomes. So in light of this, we believe that there is an opportunity, in light of this narrative change, although we don't think it has changed, uh, a lot. Uh, there is an opportunity for the IMF to strengthen its commitment to those uh, social objectives. How? By adopting a different approach, really. And so our, the paper, this, the paper's suggestion for an alternative framework for macroeconomic management in the region is the following. Uh, basically, when it comes to monetary and exchange rate policy, we adapt some of the basic, some of the uh, important findings by uh, a paper by, written by SOAS professors in 2011, Professor Elisa, Hannah, Professor McKinley. We do believe that monetary policy needs to play an accommodative role to more expansionary fiscal policies. But those expansionary fiscal policies uh, need to be d designed or thought of in a broader uh, kind of development project uh, with sectoral uh, policies with clear industrial policy um, that would kind of induce, that would bring forward or uh, try to uh, stimulate such produ productive investments. Um, there should be sufficient policy space for those countries, for Arab countries and developing countries in general, to devise an exchange rate management strategy uh, that would. Uh, uh, well, uh, that is centered about the attainment of a relatively competitive rate, a stable one, in order to foster export competitiveness and economic diversification. <laughs> For fiscal policy, we do believe that the IMF should rethink its cyclical, uh, its pro-cyclical fiscal policies uh, and should uh, devise more uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policies, especially in times of, in recessionary times. So, um, there should be uh, some sort of um, um, help for those countries to, to design their own policies when they want to kind of uh, propose public or private sector investments um, that, uh, well, fall under this general uh, mm -hmm. development project. Um, obviously, debt relief should be one very important um, option on the table. Um, there should be an institutionalized process of negotiation among different stakeholders in a way that balances the different components of reform, economic, social, and political. Um, but before I, before I finish, there's just one thing that I think is very important. What kind of industrial strategy, what kind of, uh, um, well, broad development strategy should be devised by these governments in order for the IMF to accept to carry on with that? I think that today, uh, the uh, general, broad, multilateral, regional, bilateral agreements, trade and investment agreements, as well as the different institutional arrangements in the WT World Trade Organization, the IMF, etc., they do constrain the ability of countries to devise more policies, uh, especially industrial policies. And I think this is where it can get a bit uh, uh, tricky because some of the agreements, like in the WTO, for example, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights or the illegality of export subsidies, etc., etc., these can greatly strict, uh, 
can greatly constrain the ability of, of countries to design industrial policies. So there should be a way to think about how to advance those, kind of, those sorts of uh, um, uh, desired policies in a way that doesn't really kind of uh, go beyond the um, <coughs> agreements or go beyond the uh, responsibilities held at the international level. So, but then again, um, just th this, this, sorry for the untidy, this is just a screenshot I got from one of the uh, books. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain you're all aware with how Jun Chang's kicking away the ladder. And this is, um, this is a graph that shows what current developed nations used to uh, adopt in terms of industrial policies, tariff arrangements, non-trade barriers, all sorts of uh, uh, protectionist policies in order to uh, protect their, con their, their, their economies. And you can see like 55% tariff rates in the United Kingdom, almost the same in the United States previously. Those, you know, cradles of, uh, supposed to be cradle of free trade, etc. So this, this shows, this clearly indicates to where some sort of an unbalanced, unequal relation, power relation between not only Arab states and the general uh, international framework, but also developing countries and richer blocs in general. So what I think to, what I think, like, uh, to end with a note, I think that uh, what, I don't have the, uh, I don't have a ready, ready answer to say what developing countries should do or what Arab countries should do, but I think that there should be more effort in terms of fighting for more policy space to adopt those policies. I, I think apart from that, nothing really will change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hassan. Um, as uh, people are kind of shifting seats, if people who are, are sitting uh, over there and don't have seats, you can grab them anywhere where you see them. We'll just wait a second for people to settle down. Okay, so um, we'll move to questions from the floor. Um, yeah, just indicate and wait for a mic. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, hi. Um, I have a question. You mentioned industrial policy and state led development. So, my question involved uh, state capacity. Uh, do you think that um, the Arab states, especially, uh, do they have the, in the adequate state capacity to carry on? state-led development, because you talked about, for example, uh, uh, Southeast Asia and the state-led development and that. Or do you think, do you, so which comes first? State capacity in order to carry out state development, state-led development, or do you leave the policies for the state and then they develop the state capacity? So uh, also about the conditionalities and about funding. State-led capacity or like industrial policy in general, you're going to need funding. So funding without conditionalities, do you think that China has any role in that and the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, or like funding from sources other than the IMF and the World Bank which carry neoliberal conditionalities? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take uh, three or four questions. Yes, over there. Hi, um, I have a question specifically on Jordan. Um, I know that um, Jordan is always portrayed as a success story when it comes to the IMF. And I want to ask about inequality and poverty in Jordan. And I know that it is, while it has been increasing, it's low relatively when compared to other um, countries in the region and uh, compared to other countries elsewhere as well. So how come Jordan succeeded in keeping poverty low and inequality low despite of uh, agreeing on the IMF package? Is it an active uh, policy by the government or is it lack of transparency? And that's it. Thanks. Yes, over, over there behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Al Hamizu, thanks very much for two uh, wonderful presentations. 
Um, I was hoping Gilbert could perhaps elaborate a little bit on um, uh, gross capital formation. One of the elephants in the room was, of course, demographics and how they've moved, moved along. Um, the role of infrastructure is very important, something we haven't really uh, looked at. And if we look, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to use the word region when referring to the Arab world. So from an intra-regional trade perspective, of course, that plays a role in some of the investments and economies of scale um, that, that we'd like to, to see in an agglomeration. Hassan, you referred to subsidies. Um, for all of the shortcomings from Washington you know, and the IMF, I think that's one of the positives we've seen in recent years uh, on energy subsidy uh, reform. I agree totally with the point on uh, these highest percentage of uh, military expenditures to GDP in the region, but on the energy subsidy side, things have gone very well. I think the issue is a coverage, um, coverage and slippage vis-a-vis uh, the dearth of data. I, I personally worked on uh, some of the energy pricing reform uh, projects with uh, countries on both sides of the Red Sea, including some of the oil states. And the issue is coverage and, and knowing where, 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 the, where, the, um, where the rents will be, it will be d distributed. And to that end, um, if we talk about conditional cash transfers, what happens to this, the energy intensive, in, uh, energy intensive companies that were, were creating some jobs, albeit through political connections, and uh, Gilbert used the, the term cronyism. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on how, how we replace or support those, uh, those companies. Thank you. Thanks. I'm one in the front here. Thanks. Uh, just wait for the mic. Paul Hudson, I'd like to thank uh, Gilbert and Hassan for two excellent presentations. Um, the, uh, what both of you said seem to be broadly consistent with your colleague Light Standing did a report for the ILO about six years ago. The Americans tried to suppress it, incidentally. But I wonder whether, in fact, there is a slight change um, in IMF policy. Um, a few months ago, earlier this uh, year, in fact, at City University, Olivier uh, Blanchot, just before he retired as um, chief economist, the IMF and then resumed uh, academic life at Harvard. I quoted, in fact, Guy Standing's report, which he was aware of. And he said, well, perhaps we went a bit over the top. So in other words, the policies indeed, on the whole, had a negative effect, which is what Guy Standing found. And also, people who work in the research team, and there's a nice example of this where two IMF um, economists were speaking at um, the UCL last Friday, it's at uh, Mariana Mazzucato's new Institute of um, Innovation and Public Purpose. They said, we're not speaking for the IMF, but it's clear that they did not fully agree with the policies that had been enunciated by the IMF officially over the past few years. So I wonder whether there is a slight change, but maybe you think it's so slight in the policies that are being put um, forward and there might be um, this idea of rolling back the state and letting <coughs> markets unfettered uh, rule the roost, uh, there might be some change. Thanks. Um. OK, thank you. Um. Thank you for the questions. Um, first, on state capacity. Um, so just to recap, you said state capacity versus. So you wanted to know whether, uh, because you had a question on state capacity and you had a question on conditionality and whether we can resort to other, whether Arab countries can resort to other, um, well, donors in that. Uh, I really don't understand, I, I didn't get the concept, of, if you can just explain the concept of state capacity so I can understand what exactly you mean. Ability to just make very, very general terms. Yeah, that's fine. You mean like... The ability to enforce, for example, uh, hmm. we're talking about industrial policy, to enforce regulations, hmm. um, and to have yeah. the trust... <coughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, I think that state capacity of Arab countries, and particularly Egypt, I'm, I assumed you're referring to Egypt, right? Yeah. Um, well, it has diminished tremendously, especially since the uh, early 90s. And uh, I would give you, like for example, in the recent 
loan negotiations with, uh, whereby Egypt was, um, Egypt's loan of $12 billion was approved uh, by the IMF. It's, um, it wasn't really that Egypt had any sort of um, kind of leverage or clout in order to uh, kind of uh, negotiate for more pro-human rights policy. It had to do with the, because it, it really, it really couldn't, it really didn't have the capacity to, to uh, well, go for the policies that were more popular in a sense. But judging from the other sorts of um, kind of sponsors, like it got five billion dollars from Saudi Arabia. Would you would you say that in the, in that loan or in that grant did it also have some sort of state capacity? I mean, it was also contingent on certain uh, political issues. Um, <coughs> I would say state capacity should come first, uh, but what is the uh, most effective way to actually go to go for that? Um, obviously, the uh, it has to be. Uh, more of a national effort to to um, strengthen strengthen economies. I mean, I don't see I don't see another other uh, ways to do that really, except for maybe developing countries coming together as a bloc and maybe creating a more powerful negotiation negotiator with uh, with donors, like in in terms of in like let's say in the WTO, for example, you you kind of have these developing country groups who go and um, negotiate on behalf of all countries on behalf of like. Uh, country blocks. Uh, whether the Asian uh, Infrastructure Bank will be, um, well, will at some point replace the IMF in terms of being a broad lender or, uh, I really don't have the answer to that. It's just that, I mean, um, the Asian Infrastructure Bank is still kind of focused on specific, on a specific region and specific projects. Uh, and if we, well, whether we like it or not, the IMF and the World Bank are still the major uh, donors, and they still got. I would say that some of some of Arab countries, for example, would go for loans or uh, for, let's say, um, well, if, like lending arrangements with IMF with the IMF, for example, not only for purely uh, economic purpose. Sometimes it's a tool for political appeasement as well, for rapprochement with. Uh, so there are so many layers to that. Um, uh, on inequality and poverty in Jordan, uh, I'm not very aware of the numbers, really, of the figures, but I would say maybe to, they might be distorted in some sense, or they might not be distorted, but there is one, one thing that is important in the context of Jordan, is that the uh, labor migration issue. Uh, so, for example, it, labor, uh, Jordan is known for the exportation of skilled labor and the importation of low-skilled labor. Uh, and that, and emigration in Jordan is uh, uh, significant. So um, I wouldn't really know until I look at the numbers and try to see them, but this might be, uh, this might explain why the, um, well, the figures are not necessarily reflective of the inequality and poverty rates that we see in Jordan, right? Uh, but again, it also has lots of other issues to deal with, right? Refugee crisis, and same in Lebanon, et cetera. Um, on the issue of subsidies, um, I think that, <coughs> sorry, um, well, the main question would be where do the proceeds of subsidy cuts go, right? Uh, you, you referred to it as a, as a, as an, as an, uh, as a success story in the region in terms of like removing subsidies, particularly recently Egypt was able to do that, Jordan, uh, Lebanon. Okay, okay. Um, Again, the, the question is really, where do the proceeds go? Are there any sort of uh, clear um, targets set forward by the IMF or the local or the government uh, for how to spend those proceeds? Or is it just like, for example, in the case of Lebanon for debt for servicing uh, purposes? So it really, I mean, look, we, of course, I mean, energy subsidies are regressive in, in, in nature, right? Because they tend to favor the rich as well. Uh, but if, if, we just, if we just kind of go for uh, subsidy cuts and removing cross-subsidization in the case of Jordan, etc., I wouldn't see any change, I wouldn't see any uh, positive impact unless we know where are these channels, right? In the, in the case of Lebanon, at least, they weren't channeled to any sort of development outcomes. Um, 
whether I think that there was a change in IMF policy, like um, I, I was, in, I, I was uh, presenting this very same study in Washington, uh, at the IMF World Bank annuals in, in October, and when I uh, discussed this issue with uh, the IMF, with the representative of the IMF, he was like, I do understand all of these concerns, and I do have to acknowledge that after, we, after you guys cited those concerns and the shortcomings to our policies, now we are reviewing, like for example, I gave the issue of Tunisia, the privatization of three state-owned banks, and the uh, salary uh, freeze, which was agreed between the government and the um, GTT, uh, the General Union of Trade Workers. Uh, and they actually suggested that Tunisia uh, should kind of uh, uh, wait before it really freezes those, wait until to see where things, where things go. But again, this is what he said. Just a few days later, uh, the I just a few days later, we learned that the IMF has frozen the second tranche of the loan because the, uh, the Tunisia was not um, kind of uh, implementing those reforms. So when it, it re when it comes to narrative, it really is the case that the IMF is trying to change. But when it comes to implementation, sometimes it's just it's it's a massive detachment between narrative and whether I think if it's going to ch whether I think there's any sort of slight change or not. I mean, obviously, uh, st at least starting the debate with issues concepts related to inclusiveness, equality of opportunities, and recently Madame Lagarde suggested that the IMF needs to start strategizing about how uh, to uh, battle inequality. I mean, those are obviously some I don't know well <laughs> breakthrough. But I don't know where, where can we get, you know? Like for the past three decades, it wasn't really <laughs> very clear how that change materialized. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. Sorry, speaking of freezing and frozen, I'm sorry it's so cold in here. We have to apologize for that. Um, okay, Gilbert. Yep, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, well, just a brief comments to add. Uh, on the issue of, 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 of demography, <clears throat> The, the uh, demography in the MENA region is no longer uh, higher than the uh, third world average or global south average. It used to be in the 70s, uh, it peaked in the 80s, but uh, it went down since then. And uh, as I showed in one of the slides, although that was quite uh, rapid, but uh, you would see that the uh, uh, the 15 to 30, uh, the number, the proportion of 15 to 30 in the Arab region is very similar to that of South Asia or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know. So that's uh, not the, well, this said, in general, of course, the demography of all these regions is, uh, is one that is quite uh, intensive and uh, therefore there is a need to, to you know, to uh, to higher rates of, uh, of growth and development than what you have in the global north. And yet, we have those low rates and they have been going down since the uprising, not going up. And that's for very obvious reasons. Everything I explained about unpredictability and all that as constituting a general condition for low uh, private investment can only be worsened by the situation created by an uprising and wars. Now you have uh, uh, three, uh, three countries uh, at war in the region, uh, key, key wars. Um, the, the issue of um, we have to be very much uh, uh, aware of the hypocrisy behind the argument that removal of subsidy for uh, fuel or bread or whatever uh, is for progressive reasons because these are regressive uh, uh, forms of subsidies and they benefit the, 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 the rich. First of all, their importance for the rich, given the, what uh, these issues represent in the consumption of the rich, is, as if you, especially if you take bread, for instance, is uh, much lower than their importance for the poor. And secondly, there are no mechanisms in the region to replace that, those poor targeted uh, me mechanisms don't function in the region with the corruption, with the, 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 the lack of uh, uh, functioning state institutions. You have nothing of that. So the fact is that every time those subsidies have been removed, this has had tremendously bad effects on the poorest, inevitably. And uh, that's why the, 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 the poor are very much against those measures. And they, are, they don't buy the argument uh, 
that it is because of uh, progressive reasons or, or, uh, or anything like that. And keep in mind, speaking of inequality, that there are no figures for, about inequality in the region. <clears throat> the only figures we have in the region are about inequality of, of uh, expenditure. <laughs> and this is very far from income inequality. I mean, there are limits to what human beings can uh, consume, of course. So the, but there are no limits for their uh, gains, uh, their uh, uh, benefits. And uh, so uh, that's why there are no, I mean, the comparisons, you often find comparisons between the region and that, that they would show you that there are gene, the Gini coefficient or, or anything like this are better in the region than in other parts of the global south. That's ridiculous because it's comparing apples and oranges. Because if you look at what the figures are, you will find that for the other regions, these are income inequality figures, and for the region, these are uh, uh, consumption inequality figures. Th these are two very different issues. Um, and uh, finally, uh, about the, the what uh, this and that economists, there are definitely, even in the IMF, uh, some people who are more uh, progressive minded than the institution. And of course, in other uh, international institutions, you, find, you may find a high concentration of progressive people in institutions like the UNDP or UNCTAD, but that's different. But even in the IMF, indeed, and we can see that, for instance, in the very, very funny uh, way in which uh, you had uh, great studies about corruption under Ben Ali and about corruption under Mubarak after the fall of Ben Ali and after the fall of Mubarak. Uh, it's, it's obvious that those who did this, these studies should have known about this before, but they wouldn't be able to do that within a, a framework uh, um, uh, like this one. Now, the, the, the key point uh, remains that uh, uh, this, this, uh, the, the, the general policy, uh, the, the, the general neoliberal framework upon which these institutions, or in the IMF in particular, uh, are based, it has not changed. And that's what I'm calling dogmatism. And you can have a very uh, uh, um, uh, clear illustration of that. If you move from the MENA region, where you have a huge illustration with uh, uh, the, the post-uprising behavior of these institutions of more of the same, but you look at the global level. I mean, uh, after, for 30 years after the Second World War, the uh, dominant paradigm in the global economy, I'm speaking of market economies, uh, was essentially Keynesian, okay? Now, it took one major crisis in the 70s, not one of the major, most important crises in the history of the system, but a major uh, uh, crisis in the 70s, uh, for this paradigm to be uh, the object of a ferocious offensive, uh, dismantling the paradigm and replacing it with the neoliberal uh, uh, paradigm. Now, we have had, a few years ago, a much more serious global economic crisis, in which we still are, the, 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 the Great Recession, as it's called, in 2007-2008, and still, still lingering. And uh, at first, when it happened, we have seen uh, the state uh, uh, in countries, including like the United States, with administrations like the George W. Bush administration, uh, violate the, 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 the textbook of neoliberalism by heavy state intervention bailing out financial institutions, okay? So at that point, you had a whole lot of comments of people telling you very uh, imprudently, uh, this is the end of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is dead and all that. Uh, the, uh, in 2008, Newsweek came out with a cover saying we are all socialists now, okay? <laughs> right? Uh, and look where we are. Actually, the crisis was seized as an opportunity by all governments to, to go for the same, more of the same. Uh, the, the, it's the same mantra that we hear, whether the, the Arab uprising or Arab Spring, as it was called, or the global crisis. The reason for it is that the neoliberal recipes were not radically enough implemented. You know, that's the point. So you have to implement them even more radically. I mean, this is, of course, a recipe for further and, and bigger uh, disasters. It shows you one thing, and I'll end with that. Uh, the global uh, economic paradigm is not a matter of economist thinking. Uh, 
it's not a matter of uh, thinking. It's not a matter of intellectual debate. It's a matter of social balance of forces. And the shift of the 70s was a product of a deterioration of the social balance of forces to the detriment of the workers' movement globally <clears throat> over, over the, 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 the previous decades. And we are still in a general framework of, of, of uh, deteriorated balance of forces. And as long as you have this, financial capital, which is uh, the, 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 the section of capitalism that is most uh, profiting from, from the neoliberal framework will carry on imposing its, its, uh, its views. In order to, to change that, it, it, it won't take, you know, we, the, the debate is here. There, I mean, there are plenty of, of discussions of neoliberalism from the start. We know exactly, we have the whole intellectual ingredients to get rid of it. This problem is not here. The problem is that it is a class uh, enforced uh, a paradigm that won't be removed unless there is a counterclass uh, uh, pressure. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, we'll just take a, three or four more uh, questions and then, or possibly more. Um, okay, <laughs> one over here at the, at the front. And then, um, and then the, the gentleman behind him after that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the counterclass forces, that you said are needed to, I suppose, overthrow the paradigm, <coughs> the existing paradigm. What manifestation might they take? I'm interested in the moment that uh, in um, Yanis Varoufakis' um, political memoirs of what he experienced in Greece um, and what he was advocating was standing up to the transnational neoliberal um, paradigm and their actors by simply suggesting that we will default on our payments, on our repayments, we're insolvent, stop ladening us with more debt, we will default. Um, and sending out deterrence to that end, do you think that's a, a, a possible manifestation of the pushback or the next era, or what <laughs> might you suggest? Thank you. Thanks. Just, uh, behind you. Okay, I have two questions actually for both of the panelists. The first one has to do with the political dimension of, uh, of the Arab uprisings. And I would like to know, because you both said that uh, basically the, all the causes of the uprisings are still there and they're actually deepening the, the neoliberalism in, in the region. So does that mean that uh, the, the Arab regimes will have to increase on their repression on the people to keep these reforms advancing because you have the, co the causes there, unemployment, privatization, poverty, or there. How are the regimes going to, to deal with that situation? That's the first question. The other question is uh, back to the economic uh, uh, question of this, this debate. Uh, I'd like to, you to make some comments on the foreign debt of the countries of the region. How important is the foreign debt in relation to the dependency of these economies to the main economies of the world, Europe, United States? And if stopping paying the foreign debt would be a measure to be considered on those countries to change the economic dynam dynamics of, uh, of the region. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you want a hand? Yeah, start here. Um, so, with increasing talk of uh, reconstruction in Syria, how does what you told us uh, play out in, in the reconstruction sphere? Thank you. And over there. Thank you. Um, I have a question about specifically the case of Lebanon, uh, where I think that the conflation of the economic power and the political power is very obvious. And the recent uh, study by Lydia Aswad, who tried to, to look at the um, inequality of income, showed that 1% of the population owns 23% of the total income and 40% per percent of the wealth. And that more or less that 1% per percent is of economic power is identical to the political power. In a context like this, where this conflation reinforces the neoliberal framework, just like the IMF wants, where did, does the, the shift come from or the change come from? And do you think that it can come from pressures from the bottom to the top within the country? 
and to what extent is that possible given recent uh, um, uh, the, the current situation also with the, the whole situation in the region. Thank you. Thanks. Any, yeah. Alan, I'm oh, sorry, it's just behind you. Thank you. My question resonates with the last two actually quite a bit. There's something, I'm from the region, so it's sometimes hard to put distance, but there's something very uncomfortable with the abstraction you have made, I think, to this much more complex and heterogeneous political environment, and at the same time quite interesting. So it would be, I think, useful for all of these questions for me as well, if you can expand on how you deal with the fact that you have made this abstraction and or are dealing with analyzing on this issue uh, in a vacuum of the more of the nuance uh, and have you compared it with IMF behavior in other countries not in the region thanks any last questions Okay, we'll have you again. <laughs> Go on. That'll be the last one. Just over there. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on um, <coughs> how the IMF behaves with um, countries in the region which it doesn't lend to. Um, and a little bit on, you alluded to it, I think, with, I think somebody mentioned Saudi Arabia, but this uh, competition on conditionality and capital vis a vis Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I'd actually disagree with the political conditionality. As you've seen, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen uh, were not areas where Egypt uh, followed suit. But of course, Qatar is a different uh, uh, discussion. Um, Gilbert, you didn't really say anything on infrastructure and the intra-regional uh, intra intra nature. Um, and finally, you mentioned NTBs and NTMs. Can you talk a little bit more about how those have developed in recent years and if things are getting worse? Uh, or better across the region. Thank you. Thanks. And the final question over here. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on one question that was asked before, and especially on the conflation between uh, elites and the state. And so if we consider that um, the state is a representation of the ruling class's power, can we consider that the state should be an actor to enact reforms that would benefit the entirety of the population? in that case, or are they just going to continue enacting the neoliberal project um, unless the state is taken over in a way? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll hear from Hassan and then Joubert. That's all? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, those are quite tricky questions, but thank you. Um, <coughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, was the first. Um, okay, I, I can try to start from last to beginning. I'm, I'm trying to consolidate two questions together on because your questions are very similar in, in terms of the state uh, business relationships. Uh, first of all, in the case of, let me start with the case of Lebanon because uh, probably is what I know best. Um, and whether the balance of power relation does provide any sort of uh, leverage for the bottom, for the grassroots to uh, come up with any sort of change. Um, in addition to the study that you just uh, mentioned, there's also a previous study in 2015 by uh, Professor Jacques Chaban from the American University of Beirut on the um, um, <clears throat> links between the banking sector and the officials or the elites in, in government. And that particular study has shown that 43% of banking assets <coughs> are directly linked to politicians and their families, and by politicians, members of the parliament or cabinet members. Uh, and 28% of um, shareholders of banks happen to be in the cabinet. <coughs> Um, so that, that kind of gives a broad picture of the links of state business relationship of what Professor Gilbert Ashkar called crony capitalism. Um, 
I think it's, it is challenging for a bottom-up approach in Lebanon, especially given the last, uh, last year's events with the grassroots group, uh, you stink, uh, or uh, we want to prosecute, or, you know, these kind of uh, movements. Uh, but again, my, my, my concern about whether these will be effective in, in, uh, or not in the future is, is whether there is a real genuine debate amongst the grassroots in Lebanon uh, on the importance of coming up with an alternative strategy for economic and political governance. Because really, as, as, you, as you might know, Lebanon is very much um, vertically uh, polarized, right? Along sectarian lines, along confessional lines. So it's not easy to uh, promote that sort of debate uh, in a country among the grassroots. But if it's successful to do so, then I think, yes, there might be some sort of potential for change from bottom up. Um, <coughs> Um, on reconstruction in Syria, was it uh, your question, right? Um, well, uh, I mean, it's obviously the, the debate now is ongoing on the reconstruction phase, but I would, I am sure of one thing. For, a reconstruct, for a successful reconstruction in Syria to take place, it has to, it has to be very different from the Lebanese reconstruction phase, because that was a massive failure. Um, and <laughs> so the, the, the um, Lebanese reconstruction uh, is essentially the epitome of neoliberal uh, uh, agenda implemented in the country. So any sort of reconstruction in Syria should, should not go along similar lines. Um, well, on the... Uh, issue of, Lebanese, of, of uh, uh, IMF, implement, uh, IMF influence in countries that it doesn't lend to. Uh, Lebanon is one of those countries, right? Um, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. I'm not very familiar with the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, but I wouldn't imagine much change in terms of, or much conditionality in terms of altering the structure of Saudi Arabia, because looking at the, uh, if you look at the empirical evidence on, let's say, the um, industrial or export structures of the country, you see that more than 90% of its budget, or not more than 90% of its exports, sorry, not its export, more than 90% of its budget is based on uh, revenues from the sector, from the natural resources sector, but uh, when it comes to the exports, that's, that figure can go above 70% as well, so I wouldn't really see any change. Now, MBS is proposing some vision for 2030, let's, let's wait and see, but uh, a case in point is Lebanon. It doesn't get any funds from the IMF. <laughs> well, it, there was only a $70 million uh, kind of uh, uh, sweeping deal, but it was part of a broader Paris 3 package for the country, so it wasn't a loan, uh, an ad hoc kind of loan. And we see the kind of, uh, it, it doesn't really stray away from the major <coughs> neoliberal doctrine that was uh, adopted, in, that was implemented in many other countries, or suggested to many other recipient countries. Um, is there any, because I've got notes here and there, I'm not sure if I missed any of the other questions. Um, was, was your question about the IMF um, behavior in other regions? Right. So, whether we looked at other regions... Yeah, you had the question about... Yeah, there was that, yeah. Other yeah. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm very aware of what the IMF uh, has done in other regions, but I would surely say that um, the very package of policies that was um, proposed for Arab countries pre and post uprisings is um, essentially in line with the broader trends of monetary, fiscal, structural policies adopted in the global economy since the 90s for the past three decades. Um, I would say that the increasing intensity and frequency of financial crises in the world, despite the taming of inflation in some of other countries, is a case in point for why the IMF, uh, or for why that package of neoliberal uh, policies hasn't <coughs> changed much uh, in, 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 uh, in, in other regions. Um, I hope that answers the question. <coughs>
<coughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Gilbert? Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> right. Thanks. Um, uh, first, I mean, th there was a, a comment on the... On, uh, the the prospect for uh, for the implementation of such reforms uh, and what it entails in terms of uh, repression. I think Egypt is a clear case. That's the country which uh, has uh, delivered uh, recently, I mean, uh, a year ago, uh, a massive uh, uh, implementation of, uh, of the, the, the full spectrum of IMF recipes. Uh, and that led to a skyrocketing inflation uh, in the country with the uh, collapse of the, the value of the Egyptian pound and uh, its effect on uh, all sorts of, of prices and therefore uh, a terrible deterioration in the condition of living of, uh, of uh, the vast majority of, uh, of, of Egyptians. But that was uh, uh, possible because of a... Uh, uh, Rep very repressive state, which is uh, quite more repressive than the Mubarak era. Actually, uh, Egypt did not just go back to the ancien regime. It, 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 uh, it went into a, a much uh, tougher version of, of, what, uh, of what you had. So uh, there is no way such measures can be implemented without uh, an increase in repression. And that goes usually, it's the normal accompaniment of neoliberalism everywhere, actually. Uh, the neoliberal uh, turn in, in countries even like the UK or the United States went along with zero tolerance and increase in repression and a huge increase in the number of people in, uh, in jail in the United States where it reached absolutely gigantic uh, uh, proportion. So we have to, to be aware that, I mean, there is no way out of, uh, of uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the crisis in the region without a, a radical change uh, of, uh, of the, the social political uh, system. And when we speak of where could the pressure come from, of course the pressure is the ability of, of oh, and it presupposes the existence also of uh, organized uh, movement uh, in, among the popular classes uh, to push for uh, the, the, this uh, uh, change from the, to, uh, the change at the top, which is the condition for a change in the in the policy that comes uh, from uh, from the top. Um, now. There is no immediate prospect for that anywhere in, in the region, but the potential is there. The potential was revealed in 2011, and uh, there are various indications uh, that this potential is still there. It hasn't been crushed, for instance. Uh, however, it needs to be able to organize in order to, uh, to, to, to fight uh, for, its, uh, for a different uh, perspective. And if you have this, then the question becomes also of the, uh, the regional and global balance of forces because, of course, um, uh, it, it, very much, uh, it very much affects the, the margin of, uh, of, uh, of action in any country, like uh, Greece was mentioned. Of course, uh, Greece was the victim of a, a European uh, balance of forces and a global one. Uh, and this, the very size of, of Greece put uh, limitations of, uh, on what it could do. It's not to say or to excuse or uh, approve the, the, the choices made by the Tsipras government, but just to, the, that's definitely uh, one aspect of the story that no one uh, can, uh, uh, can miss. But this said, even countries like Jordan, for instance, Jordan was mentioned, even countries like Jordan, uh, if you see the, 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 the income of the, uh, in the exploitation of its na natural resources and compares the, the, the rate of exploitation of such resources in neighboring Israel, you will see that there is a potential of, uh, of national resources that uh, is, uh, is there, uh, not to mention the, 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 the capital flight that we saw that is a general feature in the region. When you had this toppling of these dictators, we heard of tens of billions of dollars 
uh, embezzled and uh, shifted away by them. So th that shows you that there are plenty of resources in those countries that are dilapidated and that with a different kind of political, social political structure could be mobilized and used for, uh, for the sake of, uh, of the vast uh, uh, majority. Um, the, 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 um, well, uh, well, I spoke of change at the level of the state because indeed the, the objection that such states are so corrupt and dictatorial and all that, that they're, they, 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 I mean, to imagine them implementing the, the right reforms is uh, something uh, uh, difficult. That's true, that's true. That's why I'm saying that, uh, I mean, we can devise different alternative policies, as Hassan was calling them, but uh, I think one should be clear about that there is no way out of the crisis without a radical social political change. And not, without a radical social political change, you won't have a real change in policies. Because again, it's not a matter of intellectual debate, it's a matter of balance of forces, of social domination. That's uh, what is uh, at stake. Um, and then the rest is a matter of, uh, of as I said, global balance of forces, the debt. Uh, well, uh, the debt has been, uh, as a, I guess every, everybody knows, a key mechanism for the subjugation of the global south and the implementation of the neoliberal changes. Uh, but that's a, a field where a matter of balance of forces is very important, so it depends on which country we are dealing with. And again, the example of Greece is uh, uh, glaring in that, uh, in that regard. Um, on the uh, reconstruction of, of Syria, all the blueprints that are being put on the table uh, presently uh, indicate something that is actually even worse than what Lebanon uh, had gone through. All the more that uh, uh, there you have uh, a state which is worse than the Lebanese state uh, in uh, many respects, in its predator, pred predatory uh, character. And uh, uh, Russia and, uh, I mean, is preparing itself to, to play a key role in, in, uh, in, uh, in taking advantage uh, of, uh, of all that. So, uh, um, but, uh, Keep in mind that this is fiction for the time being because uh, the situation in Syria is not exactly one where reconstruction is for tomorrow, uh, unfortunately. Um, finally, uh, yes, of course, uh, the, the issue of uh, the regional uh, dimension is very important in any alternative view for the development of, of, uh, of the region you mentioned about economies of scale and all, all that, of course, is, uh, should be obvious. Uh, uh, at the time when you had a lot of real regional experiences, not only in the global north with the European Union or NAFTA or whatever, but even the global south with the uh, um, uh, south, southern uh, tip of uh, Latin America, for instance, or other parts of the world, here you have a region speaking the, I mean, having the same official language and all that, and, uh, and not able to go beyond uh, some, uh, you know, uh, symbolic uh, gesture in terms of, of uh, economic relations, with each country having much stronger economic relations with, uh, with the global north than they have between themselves. And, uh, and of course, that's a, a major, uh, that's one, one of the conditions of the exploitation of this region, and that's uh, why it was carved up by, by colonial powers, and uh, including the creation of very artificial tiny states around the oil fields, like in the Gulf uh, region. Um, and uh, and uh, that's also why every uh, project at uh, unification, like the one of Nasser in the past, was fought uh, uh, very viciously by uh, by the I mean by 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 the United States uh, above all, but Western powers in general. Please join me in thanking uh, Gilbert and Hassan. <laughs>